<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is E.R. Anderson. I'm here tonight with Jess Zimmerman and Angela Chin. We're here to celebrate ACE. We are so, so, so excited about this book. Um, we are usually coming to you live from Karis Books and More in Decatur, Georgia, um, the physical space of Karis. But we are here um, from our respective homes. Uh, I'm in Atlanta, and Jess and Angela are both in New York City, um, in Brooklyn, actually, uh, part of New York. And so I want to introduce both of them and then tell you a little bit about Karis and then kick right off because I see lots of folks in the chat really excited to be here. Lots of ACE folks um, really excited to feel seen, I think. So if you want to introduce yourself, if you want to say how you identify in the chat, where you're watching from, feel free to go ahead and do that. We're really thrilled that you're excited. Um, so I'm here tonight with Angela Chen. Angela is a journalist and writer from New York City. Her reporting and criticism have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Paris Review, Electric Literature, Catapult, and elsewhere. Chen is a member of the ACE community and has spoken about asexuality at academic conferences and events, including World Pride. You can find her at Chenjala or at AngelaChen.org. So I hope y'all will check those sites out. And we're joined by Jess Zimmerman, who's going to be our moderator tonight. And Jess is the editor-in-chief of Electric Literature. I hope that y'all know about Electric Literature. It's an awesome site. Her essays and opinion writing have appeared in The Guardian, The New Republic, The Washington Post, Hazlitt, Catapult, and others. Her newest book, Women and Other Monsters, which is on feminism and mythological creatures, is coming out in March 2021, and you can pre-order it today from Karis Books and More as well. So uh, just go ahead and get that when you're buying Ace. Um both are ready to go. So I want to um, just give you a little orientation. This little teal button at the bottom of your screen, you can click on that, and that is where you will go to buy Ace and also to pre-order Jess's book if you like. At the middle of your screen, you should see a button that says ask a question, and that is where you're going to obviously ask a question. If you see that someone has already asked a question that is pretty close to your question, you can upvote it. It's like Reddit. So if you're like, that's a pretty good question, just click on it. And, um, and that will let us know that it's one that you really like, and we'll be sure to ask it. And then finally, um, we're going to be asking you some polls in just a little bit. There's going to be a slideshow with some polls, so um, you'll get a chance to vote on those polls. So just pay attention when you hear the polls coming and click on all of those. So I'm going to um, pop out of here and let Jess take it away, and we're going we're gonna to get this party started. So thanks, everybody, for being here. I love that y'all are here, and um, and I'm so thrilled to see the community happening in the chat already. Yeah, thanks so much, ER. Thank you, ER. So hi, I'm very excited about your book, um, which is, today is its birthday, um, and I'm very excited to uh, to be here at Karis, and obviously we wish that, um, I wish I could see you in person, and we wish we could be with, with all of you guys in person, um, but the upside of that is that we would not otherwise be able to do an event at the South's only only uh, oldest feminist bookstore, um, and so so actually uh, let's let's sort of start with that. Like, why are we doing this at a feminist bookstore? Obviously, if we're talking about you know an underrepresented identity group, there's something kind of fundamentally feminist about that. Um, but for for asexuality specifically, how does that kind of dovetail with our understanding of modern feminism? So we're going right in the deep end. And I think the interesting thing is that there, in some ways, is some tension between asexuality and some forms of modern sex positive feminism. I'm a feminist. I cannot remember a time when I wasn't a feminist. But I think today, feminism looks very much like one specific strand. And I think that there's a tension between that kind of feminism and asexuality and what it means for asexual feminists. And I think that one thing that Ace tries to do is to bring balance. So we have a PowerPoint presentation that has a short clip and we wanted to talk about that. So ER, if you can play the clip. And the clip is from Sex and the City. And I will say that I have never watched Sex and the City, but I did have a Tumblr once. And so because I have a Tumblr, I saw this clip all the time. And it very much represents a certain strain of feminism that I think people recognize. So yeah, if you could just play, it's a very short clip. And no one look at the side. That's <laughs> for later. No spoilers. 
It's short enough that if it won't play, we'll just. Oh. Can you? Can right. you hear it? Because I didn't hear it. I think we might just have to do a dramatic reading of it. I do not want to do a dramatic reading of it. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember the exact wording, but this is. It, it's a, we, can, we can go back from that. I'm gonna. Chair. I'm gonna try one more time. I think it's because okay. my mic. Let's try this. Nah. <laughs> well, luckily, I had to find the clip and do all this stuff to it to try to make it work. So I remember the line. So essentially, oh. it, it is. Um, Samantha from Sex in the City. And then she's saying something like, I will wear whatever and blow whoever I want as long as I can breathe in you. And this is the GIF set that I saw so many times when I was on Tumblr. And I think it represents a certain kind of feminism and it's definitely feminist. However, I feel like there's this sense in which fe feminism nowadays means, you know, we have liberated our sexuality. And so we can have as much sex as we want, like the Samantha example, except as one person I interviewed said, as much sex as we want always seems to mean a lot of sex. You know, like there's really this idea that everyone naturally has this voracious libido. And if you're a man and you don't feel that, then you're not a real man. And if you're a woman and you don't have a voracious libido, then it's kind of like, oh, um, it's because you're repressed or you're oppressed or you haven't done the work of throwing off the chains. And, and oh, oh, sorry. sorry. I was I just echo. Oh, Does anyone else hear the echo? It's gone now. I okay, heard. okay. That was frightening. I don't like the sound <laughs> of my <laughs> Anyway, so you know, there's that idea that, um, that everyone has a baseline of sexual desire. And that idea is what I call compulsory sexuality. You know, a play off the idea of compulsory heterosexuality. The idea that everyone who is normal um, desires sex and wants sex. And if you don't, then you're broken or different. And that's a force that I think is very, very present and that aces feel very much. And in the book, I talk about how that doesn't have, compulsory sexuality is not a good force. Not everyone has to be like this. And that asexuality doesn't have to be intention. Like there's other ways to be a feminist that we can balance this view of feminism with other things. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I, I feel like for, for in terms of feminism specifically with, with compulsory, heterosex or compulsory, compulsory sexuality, if you equate being a liberated woman with being a highly sexual, high libido woman, that's kind of an, an additional axis of oppression where like, oh, being liberated means this very specific thing. Um, and you cannot possibly be liberated if you aren't feeling this way. Um, yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I think about a lot is that I don't think I'm a sex positive feminist. And I think this is kind of a semantic thing, right? Because obviously the activists who tried to fight for women's rights and for sexual equality, when they say sex positive feminism, they're like, they're saying there's a double standard and people are slut shamed and you absolutely should, you know, women should be able to do the same things as men. And I believe all of that, but I don't believe that sex itself is the same as pleasure, but we use the words kind of interchangeably. And I think words matter. And so I think that's something that we all should be thinking more about, which is why we jumped into this right off the bat. Right. I mean, it could be that you, that you're the only sex positive feminist the people who call themselves sex positive are not actually sex positive if they're not leaving room for the idea that, you know, having sexual relationships is not the foremost thing on everybody's mind. Yeah. Um, I think that in a lot of spaces that there's not that much affirmation of other types of sexuality. And in other cases, it's just, it's subtext, right? It's not explicit. I've never had anyone say to me, oh, you know, people who have more sex are more feminist, women who have more sex are more feminist, but there's this idea in the air that having more sex is cool and it makes you more politically leftist. And there's, it's, an, it's like an aesthetics that's tied together with the politics. Yeah, which goes all the way back to Sex in the City, if not before, um, like yeah. holding these people. I mean, it definitely, definitely goes before. Yeah, <laughs> right, good point. Um, so, so I want to, I mean, I, I can see from the chat that like you have, and this is not surprising, you have so many ACE fans. 
um, I'm sure from sort of all over the asexual spectrum, which is something that we, you know, we can talk about sort of the spectrum aspect of it. Um, but, but, you know, I, I feel very strongly because of the stuff that, that you're talking about with compulsory sexuality, that kind of affects everybody and really is, you know, the book is about ACEs, but it's kind of for everyone. Um, and so for the people who are attending who, who aren't asexual and who maybe like don't fully understand what the experience of that is like, I wanted to, um, I was very excited that in the book you wrote about this game show that you watched with some of your friends and one of them said, I think I understand now what it feels like to be asexual. Cause I think that friend was me. Um, and I was <laughs> really excited to talk to you about this game show which is called Naked Attraction. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about Naked Attraction and sort of what, what it is? Right, so we actually had a clip from Naked Attraction. That was a clean clip. And yes. I don't think we should necessarily try to play it because I, I mean, who knows if that's gonna happen. So Naked Attraction is a dating show. And my friend described it to me as a naked dating show. And I was like, oh, it means like they go on a date and they're naked. But it's actually even worse slash better than that, depending on how you feel. So the main contestant was looking for love. They stand in the middle of this room and there's like six people in neon tubes and all of them are naked. And every round, basically what happens is that they, the like neon tube lifts and then so the first round it lifts to the waist and you see only what is below the waist and the second round it lifts to i think like the chest like so the face is hidden but everything below there is um is visible and i highly encourage everyone unless you're sex repulsed to go try and see a trailer of the show because first of all it is absurd startling horrifying in many ways but second of all, I think it kind of gets at what the experience of asexuality is for people who aren't necessarily sex repulsed. You know, I think that many people, when I talk about asexuality, they're like, oh, you know, it, even if they understand it's not the same as celibacy, they think, oh, like it means you like hate sex. And I'm like, no, that's not, that's not what it is. It's possible to not experience sexual attraction without hating sex. And then they're like, oh, what, what does that mean? And if you watch that show, which I really wish we could show you a clean clip of it, because it's so yeah. absurd, you get an idea. You can, you can try. I don't think it really needs the sound to for people to get the picture. Okay. We, can, we, can, we can try. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One moment. Okay. Um, Moving forward. So bear, bear with us. Yeah. <laughs> May not have sound, but yeah. See, there's the imagine sound. that the sound is very dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> it's clean. Don't worry. That's about as yeah. There aren't in the actual show, though. I mean, this is important. This is a British show. In the actual show, there are genitals. Um, so first of all, don't don't watch it if you don't want to see genitals. But also, like, it's really stunning to an American audience that there are just like wangs all over the place. Um, and they just put them on TV. Um, and I think what was what was so striking to me about this show in terms of sort of understanding, having having, I think, a more nuanced understanding of asexuality is that like it very cleanly kind of puts a divide between sort of the human body and the attraction response. And you can have a lot of other responses to it, and people do. You know, and you can see them sort of sweating and trying to evaluate people and not being able to sort of make any kind of human connection between this body that they're being asked to evaluate and an actual person that they might be attracted to. And so they're trying to sort of aesthetically evaluate these very specific aspects of the body. And they're like, oh, well, I like those hands or whatever. I like their tattoo. Um, yeah, like in the clip, which no one can hear, but what they're saying is one the host is like, Oh, why did you disqualify this person? And then the guy is like, Oh, because of his toenails. And it's like, What? Yeah. <laughs> the thing about this show is that it's not actually sexual. Like it sounds like the most sexual thing there could be, right? You're literally looking at someone in their nudity. But if you really watch it, it's so absurd. 
It's not erotic at all. You look at it and it's just bodies. And it really is like a caricature of what some people think sexual attraction is or, or can be. And so for me, like when we were watching it together, Jess, it was like, no one was feeling anything. And it was just like, you you see what you're, you see something that's supposed to be titillating to you and it's not titillating. It's not this different from seeing someone's elbow. And I think that is what, um, that is what was interesting to me about it as a way to try to get ace experience. Because oftentimes like, you know, people ask me like, what does it mean? And I'll go on all these definitions, you know, aces who are here, you'll know, like you're always like, oh, it's not the same as celibacy. Some people want relationships and others don't. You have to do this whole TED talk, um, which sucks. But watching that, I think for my owl friends was a way of getting at like, oh, like you see these people and you're supposed to feel something, but you don't actually. And what is going on? And is anyone feeling something? So yeah, if you, that, that show is really something. Is what it's saying. essentially, it's being demanded of you. You're being expected to feel something. You're being expected to feel something that is separate from, okay, I see a penis or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And you, like, it's truly impossible. <laughs> it's truly, it's truly impossible. It's like, how can I decide based on five seconds and like your knees? Yeah. Whether yeah. I'm attracted to you or not. You know, there's so much more that goes into attraction. But the way we talk about it and the, like the way we assume sexuality works is just not in sync with the reality. Yeah. Um, and so that also, we were talking about this a little the other day, that reminded me of a game that we used to play in college um, called Cute Hot Sexy, um, which we have we've prepared a little bit for you guys. But the, um, the basic idea, what we used to have is we, we had like a big chart on the wall and you would write down something and then people could vote if it was cute, hot or sexy. Um, and cute just means, you know, cute, cute, cute. Um, hot means conventionally attractive, and then sexy means you want to have sex with them. Uh, and when we played it in college, it didn't have to be people, and in fact, a lot of the time it wasn't people. Like you would put like the Norton anthology of literature, is it cute or sexy? Um, but we thought we would play it a little bit with you guys and some real people just to sort of drill down on this idea of like, what is, what is it to find somebody sexually attractive, and how is it different from sort of recognizing that they have you know nice features or something like that um, yeah like what we're trying to get at here is that it's so like we talk about length we talk about attraction we talk about sexuality and it feels like almost every conversation just ends with someone being like they're just hot okay you know like it ends with like i'm feeling this and you're maybe not feeling that and like how do we talk past each other and we act like attraction is easy to describe, but it's really not. Also, I see someone in the chat said something like, oh, this is my first time knowing the exact definition of hot. This is our definition of hot. Yes. For the of this game. <laughs> what the actual definition of hot is, I think I still don't know. Yes. So yes. For, for, for the purposes of of the game, hot means that like, you know, they have a symmetrical face. They, you know, have sort of classic, you classic. Know, Beautiful. Western beauty features. Handsome features, yeah. So. Yeah. So this is the first one. This is Kristen Bell. I feel like this is an easy one. Um, yeah. Do we have the poll? Yeah. If you pull, it's in the it's in the bottom bar. Oh, I see it. So the thing about this being virtual, although some parts of being virtual suck, is that this is anonymous. So you know, if you find her very sexy, and for some reason you're ashamed of that, then you know, no need. <laughs> Now, for, in a lot of cases in real life, people will be two or three of these things. But yeah, of course, I absolutely. Think you, I think you have to pick. Um, so this is good. This is actually shaking out pretty much how I expected. And I, I put Kristen Bell in here as an example of somebody that I was like, I, she is definitely cute. I think she's probably hot. I find her, I think she's zero sexy at all. Like, and I, and, and like, that's not a criticism at all, but like, there's just something to me about her that's like not you don't think about sex when she's on screen. Right, but then there's, again, with each of these, the question is like, but why not? Like her face is symmetrical. Right. Her hair is blonde. You know, what- She's charming, she's very adorable. What's wrong with her? Yeah. Um, so- And, and, and that's, that's exactly the thing. It's like nothing, because there's nothing wrong with not finding someone sexually attractive, right. whether it's specific to them or, you know, more general. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like, 
it's it's so funny that like even you sort of jumped to like, oh well, what's wrong with her? Like, well, nothing's wrong with her. Just she's wrong. not sexy. So why isn't she? Like, why aren't we drawn yeah. to her? Anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're ready for the next one. Yeah, let's do the next one. Michaela Cole, I think, is such a good one for this because she's like she's very sexy. I also think she's very cute. Like she judged, she was a judge on like Drag Race or something like that. And just like her, her, you know, off screen personality is unbelievably cute to me. Um, but in a lot of ways, like her face, I and mean, this is partly because our idea, you know, our beauty ideals are so incredibly white. Um, but in a lot of ways, like her facial features are in strange proportion to one another. You know, she's a very, very specific looking person. She doesn't look like kind of the generic, you know, this is what a be an aesthetically beautiful. Yeah, she doesn't look like Megan Fox, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is interesting though, because most people said that she was hot, as in she's like conventionally attractive. Which yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say she's conventionally attractive, but not that many people said that she was cute or sexy. Therefore, yeah. what is attraction? How do we feel about anything? Yeah, no. This is uh, this is surprising to me because I definitely think that she's that she's sexy, but not conventionally attractive. Right, right. Can we do the next one? Let's do the next one. Yeah. This is Liam Hemsworth, right? When I was writing this, I was a little, yeah. like, is it? I crazy? think so, yes. No, but the rate, the, okay, so to me, the difference between the, the Go Fug Yourself girls used to, um, used to call this guy Brown Hemsworth. And to me, like the difference between Brown Hemsworth and Chris Hemsworth, who I think of as the main Hemsworth, is that Brown Hemsworth is like not sexy. Like he's obviously very handsome. He has a very handsome face. And also to me, otherwise is like nothing. Like he's a nothing person. Yeah, that's how I feel. And I think that's how, according to this poll, most people feel he is so bland to me. I think if I saw him in the airport, not dressed like this, I would, you know, like he's, there's nothing about him draws me to him. And that's, I mean, he's an interesting case because like, I feel very differently about his brother. Like, I feel differently about his brother, who is Chris Hemsworth for those like me never watch movies. <laughs> I see Chris Hemsworth, I think is sexy. Liam Hemsworth, I'm like, whatever just not, does not ring my bell. Okay, so really quick. So I saw someone, David, hello, ask what's the category for, category for we like how they look in an intense way, even if it's not conventional, but it's not about sex. And for me, this was actually a very, this was on purpose. That word is still sexy because when we def we described it as you're personally drawn to them, like you think like you like their vibe. We didn't say you want to have sex with them. And that's kind of the meta purpose of this game is because I am an asexual person. So kind of by definition, I am not sexually attracted to any of the people we are, you know, that are on the screen, but I can still play this game. And this is like a version of the game I probably played when I was in middle school with my friends. And I think that's part of the reason why it took me so long to realize that I was ace because of the way we use language. Like I can say I'm drawn to some people and not others. And without talking about it in a more nuanced and specific way, how can I know exactly what I feel is different? Does that make sense? I mean, I, I may have said that sexy was you want to have sex with them because that was that was the official rules when we first were playing the game. But the, but we were also doing things like truly the Constitution was one of the c competitors. So <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily mean like that would that would be physically a problem um, in in a number of ways and probably also illegal. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't literally mean you want to have sex with them. It means, like you said, that sort of that distilled version of being whatever it means to be attracted to somebody. Yeah, I mean, I wish we'd done this with the Constitution, but you didn't tell me that we did with objects, and instead we're just, you know. But I like the <laughs> point. Yeah, for me, like, so much of the book is really about language and experience, and how you know. How do I know? It sounds very like you know philosophy 101 but it's like how do i know that what i'm feeling as blue you're feeling as green and what i'm feeling as this kind of attraction is that kind of attraction like what does it mean especially when we have this very um unsophisticated understanding of, of what attraction is and most of us just have conversations on that level where it's like oh they're cute oh they're sexy i have a type we just don't go deeper than that and i think that's part of what 
asexuality can bring is like asking these questions, like, what does it really mean? What does it mean if they all look the same to you? You know, some people that I've spoken to and interviewed to, um, interviewed for the book, they're like, oh, one person said, everyone looks the same to me, except Matt Bomber, who is pretty. Is it Matt Bomber? I don't, is that his name? They, yeah. But I, I kept trying to put him in this game, actually, because I'm like, he's the one person in Magic Mike XXL that I'm like, that person is not sexy at all. Um, yeah, so it's interesting because I think we don't think about the level to which not only like sexual attraction, but so many other kinds of attraction are so granular and so specific. Um, let's do the next one. Yeah, and one of the and one of the points that you made in the um, in the book also that I think we can we can talk about while we're uh, polling the next person mm -hmm. um, is that it's not just that asexuality is a spectrum sort of within the identity of asexuality. It's that like there's not really a hard line necessarily at which something be you know there's not like a quantifiable point at which you go from allosexual to asexual, it's a spectrum Absolutely. all the way across the board. And people may feel, you know, and whether you decide, whether you identify as asexual or not, like that sort of a personal um, decision, but it's not necessarily a, ref a, a sort of one-to-one -one reflection of whether, of how much you experience attraction or how you experience attraction. These are things that like for everybody kind of across the board, these are questions that we may at all times be talking past each other. Yeah. You know, we may just not, you know, two, two asexuals or two allosexuals may not mean the same thing if they say someone is attractive. Absolutely. And one of the people that I interviewed was from, um, she grew up uh, in a small town in Oklahoma, which was very religious, but she was atheist um, from a young age. And so she told me about how she would go to the pews and, you know, they would be praying, but like she'd be making faces at her friends because, you know, they didn't really believe it. Like they'd be going through the motions, but they didn't really believe it. And then she said that later realizing she was asexual was very similar to her because she was very flippant about sex and made sex jokes all the time, but she thought they were all in on the game. And when her best friend had sex for the first time, this woman was like, oh, was it terrible? Did it hurt? And her friend was like, well, it was, like, no, like it was something that I wanted. And this then was when, um, this woman that I interviewed was like, oh, people actually feel sexual attraction. It wasn't just a game that we've all been, you know, yeah. kind of collectively playing. But back to Gemma Chan. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I have, no, I have no quibbles with this. I think she's actually all, all three, so. I we think she's hot, but I think she's not, to me, she's not sexy. Maybe she's just too classically beautiful. But someone recently said that I would be played by Gemma Chan in a biopic, and it was Ooh. honestly the nicest thing I've ever heard because mostly people say I'd be played by Aquafina. So, yeah. Well, and the idea, actually, the idea of somebody being too beautiful to be sexy is also really interesting. Like, mm -hmm. is is that, you know, for some people, that's a necessary component. Um, let's let's do the next one. Yeah, um, we have two more. Yeah. But, uh, but what, so one of the things um, that I think is sort of a theme throughout the book is something that I think people may um, may sort of be experiencing right now with playing this game, which is which is sort of having this realization. It's something that everybody that you talk to basically describes of saying, "Oh, wait, am I am I on a different wavelength than everybody else?" Um, and this is another thing that I think you don't have to be asexual to feel that. Like you may look at these results and say, I can't believe everybody is saying this person is hot. Where have I been? You know, what what are they thinking? What what am I feeling? Is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with them? Yeah. So I what I'm seeing from the chat is people being like, How dare you put this on our screen? And I know <laughs> that they can't see our faces, they see the screen. So I understand. <laughs> like Davidson to me, it's like this optical illusion where if I like cross my eyes, I can kind of see it, but otherwise I don't. But the point is that men, like the, during that point when he was dating Ariana Grande, a lot of people just like came out as finding him very sexy. A lot of people. <laughs> and apparently there's seven of those people participating right now. So, you know, again, like what is it that draws us to each 
to each other, you know? You're allowed to abstain, by the way. I abstain on this one. Yeah, you're allowed to abstain. Like, I don't find him cute, hot, or sexy. Um, but he is but, he's a frequently cited, like, ugly, sexy celebrity. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one um, so we can take this off of our <laughs> off everyone's screens. Okay, we got in a fight with this one about this one because I said we should put Rami Malek right after Pete Davidson because a lot of their facial features are similar. And well, you said, how dare you? It was very disturbing to me because I actually find Rami Malek extremely appealing. And this is, goes back to what someone said, like, it's not about sex for me. It's like, I do, I find him intense and I'm drawn to him. Mm -hmm. uh, how dare you compare him to Pete Davidson, who <laughs> I would not look at twice. But, you, you know, like, what, but why is that? Like, I can see they do have kind of similar facial features. Why is that, that there's so, that it can be so different? You know, why is attraction so complicated and why don't we talk about that? And you're literally, you're literally like attracted to one of them and repulsed by the other one. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just, it's not just that you felt neutral about Pete Davidson. Like you agreed <laughs> with everybody. Yeah. Um, thank you to whoever said that his facial features are not similar to Pete Davidson. I feel validated. <laughs> um, anyways, let's take this off so they can see our beautiful faces. My face that looks like Gemma Chan's. You're welcome. That's right. <laughs> and my face that looks like Pete Davidson's. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, Jess. So, so one of the things that that I feel like we were sort of trying to evoke with this game, and also with, um, you know, it doesn't work as well with the clip um, as as if you like sit down and watch a whole episode of Naked Attraction. But it's the same kind of idea. Um, is sort of the same experience that I had reading the book, which is that if you spend enough time, sort of like really dicing up. You know, what does it mean to, what does attraction mean? How does attraction manifest for me personally? How does it manifest in general? What does it mean to like be sexually attracted to someone versus aesthetically attracted? What does it mean to want to have sex versus like being fine with having sex? You kind of get into a headspace where you're like, oh shit, what is sex? I don't understand anymore. I don't know what it means. Um, and I feel like, you know, you're a science writer, um, a science journalist. And so I suspect that kind of your instinct when you're faced with a question that is that is that kind of existential, like what does what does sex mean? What does attraction mean? Um, that your instinct is to go and, you know, find research, find experts. That's very hard in this case um, because sexuality, you know, sex, there's a lot of research about the space kind of around sexuality, um, there's there's often nothing. And you actually talked in the book about how um, Kinsey, who we think of as kind of the, the main, the first and main sex researcher really threw out a lot of asexual data. So like, how did you, how did you handle trying to research this book when there substantially is not really a lot of authority? I think that well, first of all, I think it's complicated because of course there's a lot of research on sexuality, right? You know, sex and gender studies is an entire field, but so much of it is through a certain lens, basically the allosexual lens, the lens of people who are not asexual. Like you said, with the Kinsey example, he came across people who were, who we would today describe as asexual when he was doing his research, but he just made them this other group X and he left it off the Kinsey scale. So when we think about the Kinsey scale, we just think of heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, and ACEs aren't included at all. And so when you don't have that research, I think it's really important to go into the narrative and mm -hmm. it's really important to just go talk to people um, and figure out what their experiences are and start from the place where, you know, ACEs are different maybe, but they're not broken, they're not lesser, and that there's a lot that can be gained from the ACE lens, you know? Even, mm -hmm. you know, two decades after the beginnings of the ACE movement, I don't think we have that much research. And I think that because the definition of ACE is so broad and there's so many experiences, um, just speaking from a scientific perspective, there's issues with collecting the research. You know, there's issues with, um, because being ACE can mean so many things, like that can make it the data like messy and that can, you know, have scientists still arguing about what it really means to be ACE. So I think that's when it's really important to listen to people and what they say is their experience. That's true, because one of the things that you know, if you're measuring sort of you're measuring sexual response in the lab, if you're trying to do it in some way that's not just self-reported, is you measure, I guess, blood flow to the genitals. 
That's one of the things that you talk about in the book is that that's not the same as sexual attraction. Sexual response is not the same as sexual attraction. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, sexual, and sexual attraction is not the same as like sexual disorder. So there is, yeah. So I think really you just have to trust that people know what their own experience is. Yeah. But that means that like it essentially turns you from a science writer into in some ways like a sociology writer and, and also substantially a personal writer. Like one of the things that you that you ended up doing for this book is writing a lot of personal stuff. And I think that was a different mode for you than what you're used to. It is different. I am a science reporter and I like writing about science. I write, like writing about technology and I am, I don't know how comfortable I am writing about myself. Um, in the book, there is a fair amount about my own experience. And I think that comes from a place of strength. I think it's important that an ace person write a book about ace people. I think that being ace helped me find people who would talk to me because they knew that I wasn't going to ask offensive questions or come from this place of skepticism toward asexuality. But at the same time, it wasn't, I don't think I'm necessarily comfortable with self-disclosure. And I think that it made me honest in a way that I think was good, but in a way that doesn't necessarily make me the quote unquote best representation for asexuality. Because at the beginning, of course, you know, I had maybe ambivalent or judgmental thoughts, or maybe I didn't quite understand asexuality, and it, or maybe I felt negatively toward it, and I had to grow and overcome that too. Yeah, I mean, was that was that challenging to you? Did you feel like your understanding of your own uh, asexuality kind of grew over the course of talking to all these different people who had slightly different, who are diff slightly different places on the spectrum, slightly different experiences? I think so. I think I'm just someone who's fairly self-conscious and I probably just care a lot about what other people think of me. And I would just meet aces who didn't have that issue. You know, they would be like, why, you know, imagine caring what allos think about me. Why would I do that? And that's just not a natural response for me. And so seeing people who were able to, to have that approach toward their own asexuality, it just showed me a different way. It was like, oh, not everyone needs to feel self-conscious as I sometimes do. That's great, because that means that basically like you're having the same experience writing the book as other people are going to have reading it. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Um, I, oh, I think definitely, you know, when you, if you read it and you see these sort of like this this great range of, of it, personal experiences and different ways of relating to yourself and different ways of sort of evaluating your relationships with other people, I think it's very, um, it's sort of, I don't know that it necessarily puts you in a place where you don't care what other people think of you. Um, but I think that, cause that's sort of what we're all, <laughs> that's the goal for everybody. Yeah. Um, but but I think it helps to, to have sort of a sense of how much variety is possible and how much variety is normal. Mm -hmm. um, and like really all the variety is normal basically. Um, so, and, and I think that this is not unique to, you know, I think this is an experience that people will have reading this book, even if they're aloe or if they're, you know, if they've never considered it, which I think is, that's probably a lot. There's a large percentage of the population, I'm sure, who don't identify as asexual because they've never considered it, um, maybe will eventually change their minds. But there's also a large percentage of the population who is aloe and still, you know, asks themselves a lot of these questions including, am I normal? Is there something wrong with me? And that was one of the sort of experiences that I had reading not only your personal experiences, you know, from your from your past, but also all of the people that you talked to, um, is that like these, these problems sound familiar to me. And I think they sound familiar to a lot of my friends. I think they sound familiar to, you know, they sound like the, the questions that people send in to Dear Prudence. Um, you know, so I don't think that you have to be necessarily identify as ace or to be in an ace allo relationship for questions about sexual attraction, about sexual communication, about expectations for those to be like really at the center of your relationships with other people. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, like you said, it's like every relation, our relationship advice question or advice question. It's like, oh, like what are my sexual rights in relationships? Oh, what if, what I'm feeling toward my friend, is that platonic or is that romantic? Yeah. Oh, I'm not interested in sex. What does that, what does that mean? Am I sick or am I not sick? Like these are questions that I think many people will have regardless of where they fall on the spectrum. You know, I think one of the things about asexuality is that it's just seen as something that's like very apart from 
like the rest of the world, but it's, I think it is a part of the world. Like you can use the ace lens in the same way you can use like the queer lens or the feminist lens. It's like a lens, not like just a series of facts, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and you know, I think that part of the reason that that I've been sort of thinking about this is that since I read the book, I am kind of looking at things through that lens. And then I read, you know, on our relationships post or something like that, where someone is saying, oh, I've been on three dates with this person and they don't want to have sex with me. What's wrong with me or what's wrong with them? Mm -hmm. Or you see, you know, oh, I've been married to this person for 20 years and they want to have sex once a week and I want to have sex once a month. And like, once you sort of recognize that as like, oh, all of these things are on the fully normal spectrum of human behavior and you guys just need to talk to each other about it. Like, I feel like I spent sort of this 200 pages really <laughs> steeped in people like communicating their sexual expectations. Um, and so that was really striking for me. I don't, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's unique to people. I don't think that experience is unique to talking about relationships. I think it's also for single people, it's a really useful lens to understand sort of the way that compulsory sexuality really deforms the way that we think about ourselves, the way that we think about other people and the expectations that we have. Right. Because it's not just about, you know, being relationships. Like if you, like we talked about at the beginning, you know, there's so many gender expectations um, built in with the amount of sex you're supposed to want or have. Or if you're disabled and you're also ace, you know, there can be a tension there, you know, because many people think that asexuality is some kind of, you know, medical issue. Or if you're, you know, not a, not white, then I think there can be all of these sexual stereotypes about how you're supposed to be, you know, how sexual you're supposed to be or not supposed to be. And that can make it a lot harder to claim asexuality. And so there's all of these these other, you know, identities um, that intersect with asexuality. Yeah. Um, yeah, and once you sort of have that lens of, of kind of understanding the way that sexuality is really imposed on people and the way that, you know, one thing that was very striking to me in the book is you start, when you're talking about compulsory sexuality, you actually start it by talking about um, like religious, uh, you know, abstinence. Um, and so that was sort of one of the interesting things about thinking about things through through understanding the, the sort of um, universality of compulsory sexuality, even non-sexual or even anti-sexuality um, like abstinence programs are existing within this sort of framework of feeling sexually, feeling um, like overwhelmingly sexual towards other people is normal. And either either that's something that from sort of a sex positive feminist lens, you're supposed to embrace, or it's something that sort of from an abstinence lens, you're supposed to recognize yourself and resist. But either way, there's sort of this assumption that that's what the baseline is. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the first story is um, Hunter who grew up in this religious environment. Yeah. And, you know, even though he did everything right, not realizing that it was so easy for him to resist love because he was asexual, once he was married, you know, and sex wasn't what he'd been promised, he still felt this great amount of compulsory sexuality that worked within purity culture. Yeah. Um, do you want to, how are you feeling at this point? Do you want to take questions? Yeah, I'm happy to take audience questions. All right, I'll pop back up. All right, um, so we got a lot of great questions and a lot of really great um, resourcing of information yeah, happening in the chat. The meetup group. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I love it. So, um, the the most upvoted question uh, is by Jenna, and they ask, "What is one of the most memorable pieces of research or interviews that didn't make the final edit?" Hmm, that's a very good question. Um. I think the one that I told about the the woman who grew up in Oklahoma and she was just kind of pretending all along and didn't realize that she was asexual, that was part of it. Another story, and I didn't include it because I think ultimately um, I, I felt a, a, a little protective, was someone who had been, um, someone who had been sexually assaulted and then they said that after their sexual assault, they felt so much of this, this narrative that, that, sec that, how do I put this? They felt so much of this narrative that people who can go out and have sex, um, like a man, so to speak, were strong. And she felt, and because of that, that made her feel like she had to go out and do hookups on Craigslist. And that was, 
and she kind of connected it to her experience. Not her asexuality, she was ace before the assault, before going out and having hookups, but I think she was talking about the effect that this, this idea that being able to have casual sex makes you strong, that strong women have sex, that strong women are able to meet up with strangers and not care. She was talking about the effect that that had on her growth and the way that she saw the world. So I would say those two. I imagine it's challenging in general to sort of um, be asexual and also talk, you know, sort of deal openly with sexual assault. So many people, so many, um, especially, you know, people who uh, present as women um, have, and trans people, so many people <laughs> um, have, have had some experience of sexual assault. Um, and there is this sort of narrative because we, as a society, think of sex as necessarily good there's this narrative that oh if you're not interested in sex that you must be traumatized mm -hmm. um, and so i just like because i heard you sort of say oh this this wasn't related she was already ace and i i would not be surprised if sort of she feels the need to say that also yeah and there's a lot of complicated kind of political issues someone just said there is a website of resources for ace survivors which there is i mentioned the book it's called resources for ace survivors but asexuality and sexual assault is very complicated um and i think it's something that doesn't get enough attention and oftentimes you know really well-meaning hotlines like rain you know they will really put forth this idea that oh like you will learn to love sex again and for ace people it's like well i don't need that that's not my goal I, i'm looking for something else right. so it's a very nuanced topic so the, the next uh, most popular question um, is, you write that asexuality is about who you're sexually attracted to, no one, while demisexuality and gray asexuality are about the frequency or the conditions under which you develop sexual attraction. Does this imply that even though demis and gray A's are part of the ace community, demisexuality, gray asexuality, and other ace spec identities that don't have to do with who you are sexually attracted to are not sexual orientations per se. Is there another way that you might describe them? You know, the truth is, I don't know the answer to that question. And it's something that I was talking to some experts about, you know, because so gray sexuality, let's say you do experience sexual attraction, but you don't experience it very strongly. I asked someone like, so technically, like, wouldn't that kind of make you aloe? And what they said, and what I agree, is something like, well, the ace is an umbrella. And if you try so hard to separate and make the and make it all like really systematic, in some ways it breaks down. And I think that's not necessarily the point, so to speak, of asexuality. And I found that actually very dissatisfying because as a science reporter, I want to break everything down. I want to have everything be super clear. And I think in the end, we I'm not exactly sure what a sexual orientation is. I'm not perfectly sure how gray sexuality it's in. I absolutely think, you know, demisexuals and gray aces are part of the ace community, but I do agree that there are these really porous boundaries and I don't have all the answers there. But one of the things that you do say in the book that like put some of these questions to bed for me is when, when people who identify as asexual, as asexual, when they find the asexual community, it makes them feel like there's nothing wrong with them. And that's like, that's enough reason to sort of say, okay, great, then you're asexual. Like you don't actually have to have this sort of quantifiable amount of asexual that you are. That makes I agree. You, count. you know, I think the less gatekeeping there is, the better. And I think it's that idea of recognition that when you find these ideas and you're like, oh, this explains something about me. That's what's important. Not looking at some really complicated chart and having to locate yourself on it. Um. So the next question is, how did you grapple with cultural, racial, body type, phenotype? And gender typing uh, this way, uh, it off, there, it causes so many linkages, and how these um, differences impact notions of attraction and desirability. So within the book, I talked a lot about how cult culture and race affect people's experience of asexuality itself. You know, like if you are an Asian woman or you are a black man, for example, that will that will impact how comfortable you feel claiming asexuality. And so I talked to a lot of people about that. I don't think I wrote a lot about how culture and, and race affect how, we, how attractive we perceive others. I just don't think I have room for that. Although of course it does. And of course, you know, beauty standards exist. 
Yeah. Um, what do you hope comes from or happens in direct response to your book? I.e., what do you hope it will do for society? I, I really hope that it encourages people to think about sex more carefully and to question themselves more. You know, I think that, you know, for a lot of ACEs, I hope it makes them, first, I hope they learn something about the community because just because you're ACE doesn't mean you know everything to know. There is no any sexuality. I certainly don't. But I, there are a lot of people who think they're aloe and maybe aren't. And even when I began, you know, publishing excerpts, people reach out to me and say, oh, you know, I didn't identify as ace, but I felt that maybe my gender or my sexuality wasn't quite fitting with what I thought the options were. And this helped me think more about wh why that might be and how I go through the world and where I can find people. And it made me think more about my relationships or made me think more about my identity. And so, yeah, I think, I think, I hope it makes people ask more questions because I don't think the book has all the answers. I don't think any book has or should. I think there need to be more ACE books, including ones that you know are critical of mine and in argument with mine and hopefully also agreeing with mine. You know, there should be more and yeah. You sort of segued perfectly into um, another question, which was what do you think future books about asexuality should cover and what do you think the future of asexual, asexual books might be? What they should cover. There's, there's honestly so much. You know, I think there should be an entire book about aromanticism, which I cover in the book, and I speak to people who are aromantic. But the ace community and the, aero, and the aero community are very closely linked. But of course, there are also people who are aromantic and not asexual. There's all of these ways to, you know, to cross cut. So that's one. And I think sometimes within the ace community, there is this tension um, between sex repulsed aces and non-sex repulsed aces because at the beginning of the community there was this sense that um aces came together because they were sex repulsed and not interested in sex and that is still in many ways the the dominant kind of idea that of asexuality the dominant image of asexuality that you see in the press and now a lot of books including mine kind of do the whole like it's not what you think it was it's actually really broad and i think that's good too but because there's such a scarcity of books about asexuality, whenever you focus on one, no matter which one it is, it feels like you're neglecting the other. And the tension is because there's just not enough books in this area. I don't think it's anyone's fault. It's just that, you know, there needs there needs to be more writing. Yeah. And this, it also connects back to, to the earlier question about the way that, that race plays in, the way that disability plays in. Yeah. You cover all of that in the book, but I remember when you were first writing it, you were saying, it's it's so hard for me to find enough people to talk to. I'm, I'm so bounded in sort of my experience. And I remember saying to you, like, you feel like you have to write every book about asexuality because in a lot of ways you're writing like the first popular science book about asexuality, but obviously nobody can. So like, we should have a book by a disabled ace person. We should right. have yeah, like there really, I felt a lot of pressure writing this book and partly that's me. Like I could be writing a book about tomatoes and I would still feel a lot of pressure. But really like when it's about a community that's incredibly diverse and it's one book and it can't just be like a list of facts, right? Like it, there should be something cohesive about it. Stuff gets cut out. And so I was always like, I want to show all the way that people can be ace, but I can't because no one read that book. Um, so yeah, like the structure of the publishing industry and the way books are sold and who has access, all of that affects, you know, ACE representation in media and in books and in what's published. Yeah, so that dovetails perfectly with the next question, which is about what do you think about asexual representation in media more broadly? This person says, I feel like it's either non-existent or weirdly fetishized. As a wannabe novelist, I find it difficult to include ACE characters because I don't want to talk about their sex life if I'm not talking about the sex life of Aloe characters. So I think they're asking, you know, how how do I include asexual characters in a way that's realistic and representative without being like, oh my God, y'all, they're not having sex. <laughs> Once again, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I don't know if I have the answer to that. I, I don't write fiction, so that limits, you know, I have some limits there. But I it is a struggle, right? Because I think it can be very hard to signal asexuality in a way that is subtle. And I also think that in many ways it feels more embodied, you know, with 
other with other orientations, it's kind of like it's oh, it's it's who you love. It's like who you're romantically attracted to. And with asexuality, that's not the case. And I think that provides a lot of um, some tension. And so I, I I totally sympathize with that. I don't know what the answer is. As for my thoughts on ace representation in general, I'm not that happy with it. Um, it doesn't. It mostly doesn't exist. Or when it does, it's usually like the quirky girl who needs to be fixed somehow. Or even Bojack, which of course many people know and love, is literally a cartoon, you know. And he's uh, and he's still like this kind of like hapless creature and the episodes with Bojack still have this very like 101 after school special feel to them, which is necessary. With Todd. Uh, sorry, Todd, what? Right. With Todd? Oh, Todd? With yeah. Todd from Bojack, yeah. Which is necessary to have that kind of feel because there's so many misconceptions, but it's a little disappointing that we haven't moved beyond that yet. You know, there's so many other representations that are possible. So I, I don't think I'm satisfied with its representation in popular media. Yeah. You did what you wrote an essay for me at Electric Lit about mm -hmm. how not even just about how it's hard to find asexuals in fiction, but how it's hard to find fiction that's not about that's not substantially about romance. So I feel like that's a good start. Like if you're if you're writing fiction and you want it to be at least more ace friendly, like maybe not everything has to be about a sexual or romantic relationship. Yeah, ace arrow friendly because it is so hard, especially in you know mainstream literary fiction, to find something that's not about the nuclear family, not about a past love or a future love or cheating on your wife or something More yeah that's as a as a bookseller i will tell you we get that question all the time from people saying i don't want to read a love story can you just tell me like isn't there a book for grown-ups that isn't a love story i want to read about other i want to read about work i want to read about friends like i have a full life aren't there books out there about that like i don't want to be i don't want a love story to like sneak up on me on page 200 either like i thought i was reading something safe you know like particularly for people who really, you know, experience that in a way that is upsetting. And then they're like, why does this have to like drop like a bomb in the middle of a book? Like, that's a question that we get a lot. And so um, as somebody like working with, with novels all the time, I can tell you like, it is something that booksellers are aware of. And I think publishers are starting to become more aware of. So I hope that, you know, eventually we'll get more sort of upfront labeling around it so that people can find books on their own. And it doesn't by any means like restrict your audience because th this was one of the things that like that I really related to, you know, as a person who's not really in this community, but still, ha you know, sometimes we all kind of overlap with it. Like I hate kissing books and that's like I like TV shows. Oh, my God. There's like nothing I want to watch because I just want to watch pals, more pals. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a number of um, sort of more like. Um, medical questions and so social questions. So I want to get to those. And I realize that you, you, you know, may or may not be able to answer them. So I'll just share them and you can kind of decide what you're able to answer. Okay, I'm not uh, a doctor, so I almost certainly cannot answer medical questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, so one person asked, so someone is born ACE or they evolve into ACE due to trauma or experience or societal factors or any multitude of reasons? First of all, the phrase evolve to sounds like Pokemon, which I'm kind of into. Um, I mean, I think honestly, this goes back to the gatekeeping point, right? Where I think at the beginning of the ACE movement, there was a lot of thought where it was like, oh, being ACE is like something you were born ACE, you're a lifelong ACE. If you're ACE for some other reason, like sexual assault, like disability, then you're not a real ACE. And there was a lot of exclusion there. And I don't think that's true. Um, you know, I write this in the book, I think, purpose and point of the ACE community is so that people who are ACE, regardless of why, can feel good about themselves and that they can have a good life without centering sexuality. And so why does it really matter why they are ACE? And I think that we can think about asexuality in a fluid way too. You know, people, some, I quoted someone saying this, like people move in and out of sexualities throughout their life. Like sexuality is fluid. We should be able to think about all of them that way. So, it doesn't have, I don't think it has to be born or evolved or, or made. Like, I think the community can be really welcoming and helpful no matter, you know, how you arrive at asexuality. And that dovetails really well with the next question, which is, I'm curious about late onset asexuality, something that might emerge in a long-term relationship later in life, rather than being something you're conscious of earlier. You know, that's really complicated. And I think 
many people would just consider quote late onset asexuality to be what happens in a long term relationship over time. Like I really don't think this is something that is an ace thing. And I think it's interesting to think about that in a in in terms of like is that asexuality? Is is someone who was allo previously being asexual? I so for me, I don't I don't think like the question of like what caused it is necessarily that interesting to me. It's more like thinking like, are you okay with this? Are you not okay with this? Um, what do you want to, how do you want to think about it? Because I don't think that, you know, if you have late onset asexuality and you want to try to increase your sexual desire, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing as long as you realize that it's not, you're not broken or you're not, there's nothing wrong with you. So it's very complicated and I don't think, but really I think this is such a common issue. And I think the important thing is whatever the cause and whatever you want to do about it, it's important to know that you're not, there's nothing wrong with you if that is what happens. Yeah. So the next question is, do you have any recommendations for how to discuss your asexual, asexual and or aromantic identity with doctors and therapists, especially when they question whether your asexuality is a disorder or symptom of mental illness rather than an identity? I don't know if I have very specific recommendations. That's a very good question. And I think that in the chat, there were a lot of people talking about this and giving recommendations for, you know, ace friendly therapists, which is super important, but it is a huge problem. Like, especially with, um, especially with therapists, there's often that idea of you're, you're not really asexual. Like aces can't be trusted to know their own truth. You're just, you just have like attachment issues or like bad relationship. I, I think the answer is just to be very honest about, you know, this is my orientation, this is how I feel. And if they don't if they don't back off, then I think the best thing to do is actually to drop them. I think that setting that boundary is important because you don't want to be spending so much time, you know, defending yourself and educating your own doctor and educating your therapist and they don't believe you. You know, I don't think it's that helpful to do that work for others. I think it's better just try as much as you can to find someone who will believe you. So the next person asks, what do you think about the effects of antidepressants on a person's sexuality? I think that my medications have dampened my sexuality, but it's hard to tell. I think, yeah, antidepressants are well known for dampening sexuality. Some antidepressants also um, in increase sex drive. So I don't know what I think about it. I think it's well known that they can have that side effect. I mean, this mm -hmm. is definitely one of the sort of oh shit, I don't remember what sex is, experiences of reading the book, because I immediately was like, no, libido is different. Like, <laughs> your sex drive is different from sexual attraction. But um, but yeah, so that's not that that's an answer. It's just, um, yeah. yeah it's, I mean, I think sexual desire, sexual attraction, it's, it's like biological. There is a biological component to that. And I wouldn't deny it. It's also psychological. It's also social. They all interact in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, so the next person asks, what, with such a small population of aces, where does one necessarily venture out to seek a relationship? I mean, there are so many dating apps that involve the gender norm. Is there hope for this population? I think there's hope for this population. I basically don't know how to date. So once again, I'm sorry to be completely useless. You know, someone actually emailed me and were, was like, oh, how did you meet your partners? Because I talk about having a partner in the book. And I was like, I honestly just turn existing relationships into dating. And at one point, if I break up with my partner, I will just run out of friends. So I'm not like, I've never been able to find a partner in the traditional way, which traditional, which is, you know, like you meet online and then you have three dates and then you sleep together. And then two months later you find the relationship. Like that just never worked for me. That said, I do think that there is I do think that there's hope, but I think it requires people being really uncomfortable and no one wants to be uncomfortable and no one wants to explain themselves. But I think this is a situation where it's, I think it's kind of similar to the doctor question actually, where it's like, if you say this and you set down a boundary and they don't, and they don't agree, really drop them. But if they're open to it, you know, here, like maybe it would be good to do that kind of education. Cause many people are well-intentioned. Many people, if they go to like you, they, you know, it can work, it just takes a lot of communication, which is also true of literally every relationship. Well, yeah. and you, you had someone in the book, um, one of the people that you talked to, and I can't remember this person's gender, I'm sorry, but they, they said that, um, that they 
actually had an easier time dating once they kind of realized that they were asexual and, and understood that because they had previously been spending every minute thinking like, am I supposed to touch this person now? Like what is being expected of me? Am I failing here? Um, so I feel like there are some ways in which like it really uh, frees you up. Yeah, um, I think a theme that emerged in people I interviewed who were dating, especially dating other allos, um, was this idea that first they were like, oh, it's, it's just not gonna work. And then they were like, okay, it's it can work. I just have to be a lot more creative about it working. I have to be really clear. I have to be able to stand up for myself. And I basically have to do this work on myself in order to be comfortable having those conversations with others. But before they realized that they were ace, a lot of people were like, oh, what's wrong with me? I just need to be more like them. And that was the switch. Yeah. So um, do you see your work as having a political dimension? Where do you see ACE organizing going from here, especially vis-a-vis -vis the queer rights movement and other movements challenging racism, capitalism, and patriarchy? I definitely see my work as having a political, um, as having a political component, because I think ACE in many ways is a political label, because you don't have to identify as ACE. You can identify, you can identify as aloe. You can identify as an aloe person who has a sexual desire disorder, right? You know, like in many ways, I think the title of ACE or the identity of ACE is, chose, is chosen. In terms of ACE rights, I think we fight a lot for visibility and I don't know how much we have as evidenced by this conversation, you know, the people in the chat still talking about all of the struggles that people have. But I think going, going forward, like there has to be coalition building, right? Because there, I mean, how can we not be part of the fight against, you know, racism and other forms, you know, transphobia when there are aces of color, when there are, you know, trans aces and non-binary aces, um, when there are gay and lesbian aces. I just, like, aces aren't just heteromantic or, or white. Of course, everything, like, to truly, um, to truly, like, help all aces, it all has to be bound up together. But for me, a lot of it is about, you know, changing norms around consent, better ace representation, um, sex ed in high schools, um, thinking about marriage um, and the place we, and the emphasis we place on romantic attraction, thinking about that differently, um, thinking about the DSM and medicalization differently, working with ACE-friendly therapists. There's so many avenues that we're organizing. Yeah. So um, I think that we've got, we've got time for about two or three more questions. So um, can you talk about how you decided on the subtitle? Oh, it was, it was a whole, thing <laughs> like the original subtitle was something like understanding asexuality and culture and of course and then my editor was like that's not catchy enough and i mean this is actually very boring the answer was that i just went to my slack group and was like please help me let's think of some you know keywords what could work what would be interesting so that is the honest but boring answer well oh, that's great um and then i think you know people are looking for support really specifically around the sex repulsed. And like, if you really, really hate sex, you know, that feels, it, it seems like, you know, really hard. And and then our culture is very uh, unaccepting of that. And do you have any advice specifically for people who are sex repulsed? Hmm. You know, when I when I hear that question, part of me is like, like feels it's it's so hard to answer because for me it feels so structural you know it's it's like other because i don't think it's a sex repulse for people who necessarily need to change it's like other people need to change other people need to you know not be weird about them being sex repulsed other people need to be more accommodating of you know anything comes up around sex repulsion so i don't feel like you know i don't want to be like the key is to be comfortable explaining yourself because I've said that like five times already. But so often when you're working within this system that's not necessarily accommodating to you, like I think what you can do other than of course organizing everything we talked about is, you know, recognize your own boundaries and draw those boundaries and do that inner work. You know, like I realize this is again, not a extremely fulfilling answer, but like when you're not the problem, but you know, society or, certain ideas that people have is like, I think that's something that, you know, being able to have those conversations and being able to work on yourself is important. Yeah. Um, and then I think finally, uh, you've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but um, is there anything else you want to say about how it feels to become a subject matter expert on something that was previously a part of your identity? It feels really 
it feels really strange. Like I keep saying, um, I wrote this book um, in part because it felt very personal to me, but you know, I'm sure some people came here from Twitter. So if you see Twitter, mostly I'm tweeting about like AI, you know, when is Facebook gonna de destroy democracy, stuff like that. So in some ways it's a part of my identity that I've kept pretty private. I've said this a little bit, but in one sense, I'm very out, right? You know, I'm doing this chat, Google my name, the book is going to come up. Very quickly, you'll realize I'm out this way. In another sense, I just don't talk to my parents about it. My parents have not read the book. I don't think they know what it's about. They don't know that I'm ace. And so that part, it's so I'm simultaneously kind of out, not out. It's it's very private. And, and in some ways, I think that I don't even feel comfortable saying I'm a subject matter expert in asexuality. And I think I think I probably am. I'm pretty sure that I am, but it just, the community is so broad that I don't, I feel suspicious of anyone who says they're a subject matter expert in it. It's only like I might know more than the average person. And I'll always try to direct my, you know, to other people who might be better sources. But it, it feels really weird to be honest, um, especially because in many ways I'm a pretty private person. But, and I never thought I'd be writing a book about asexuality. I thought I'd be writing a book about, you know, how Google is going to take over the world or something. But it felt, when I was first grappling with my own asexuality, it felt so um, frustrating that I couldn't have these conversations, that they felt inaccessible to me, that I couldn't talk about these things with my allo friends because I had to do so much explaining. And I thought maybe if there's a book like this, that we can skip the explaining and then start thinking about these questions. Like that question about like, oh, so is gray asexuality, is that an orientation? What is an orientation? What is sexuality? You know, like once you blow up, some of the assumptions, then you can start having new conversations. And so I, yeah, I hope it does that. Yeah, I think it will, absolutely. And I think the fact that there are 281 people who wanted to be here tonight says how important this book is um, and how needed it is. And the amount of conversation that we're having in the chat and resource sharing is huge. Um, the, it's very clear to me that people need community um, and this book is gonna, you know, community can form around books. And I hope folks know um, there's also a list of other books in the back of this book. Yeah. So there's further reading, there's further resources throughout. So really this is like a support group in and of itself. You can, so. the, yeah, you can get this book and you you have the voices of other ace and aromantic folks and you, you get pointed, it's a map to other resources, which is really, um, that's huge. And the best books do that. So. I think it's a gift to many people. Um, so thank you for being here tonight and for this amazing conversation. It's been wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, um, I want folks who are in the chat to know that this will immediately be available for rebroadcast. So as soon as we are done uh, and we close it down, it will be available, but the chat will still be here. So you can go back through and if you're like, there were a million links that I didn't get to open and I was my focus on the talking and not on the reading. That's great. Just go back, scroll all the way to the beginning and you know, you can open the tabs and everything um, and you should be able to, to check it all out. Um, this green button is where you're gonna buy Ace from Karis Books. <laughs> Karis is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. Um, we are queer owned. We've been around since 1974. It is really important and valuable that folks um, support independent bookstores because we um, are the spaces where these conversations get to happen. So um, we know people's money is maybe not great right now. So that's why all these events are free. Um, but we really do uh, really appreciate your support. We also um, have a nonprofit and that's how we pay for like this internet platform that we use. So even a dollar thrown our way really helps us keep this going. Um, and we're very grateful. The other thing is that we're gonna be repackaging this with captions and putting it on YouTube in the next couple of days. So if you um, have a friend who's deaf or hard of hearing that you know would really like to see this um, and be able to read the captions, um, just let them know that it's coming and we'll be, we'll be posting it on our Keras Circle Twitter. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, again, this has been really lovely. Thank you, Jess, for being a wonderful moderator and conversation partner. Um, and thank you, Angela, for this very necessary book. I think it's gonna change a lot of people's lives. Um, and thank you to all of our wonderful watchers at home. Um, Y'all have, uh, have really enlivened this conversation. So um, come back, come back to other Keras events, uh, 
if you if you know somebody who would really love this book, please tweet at Angela and and share this book far and wide. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. So I hope everybody stays safe and well. Um, get the resources that you need, and um, hopefully this book will will make it so that you know more books can be written. Thank you, Yar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.